everybody. Welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. In this video, we're going to go over the last chapter of the book of Daniel. This is part of a series where we're, where we're going chapter by chapter through these different books of scripture. We've done Joel, Revelation, and now once we're done with this video, we'll have completed the book of Daniel. And uh, you don't have to watch these in order, but if you want to, I have playlists set up uh, for each one of these books. So you can go there and I have them labeled so you can go chapter by chapter. Uh, in case you miss some. But usually what I find is you can kind of look at, at these separately and uh, take a lot out of each chapter, independent of the rest of the book. Anyway, uh, so after this, it turns out, as of right now, uh, with the poll that I put out about which book we should do next, I have 411 votes that have come in, and it looks like Doctrine and Covenants is in first place with 43% of the vote, followed by Isaiah and then Ezekiel, and then Zechariah, and then Jeremiah. So we'll be moving on to Doctrine and Covenants. Uh, I have already done this poll a few different times, uh, at least two times before this, and I never included Doctrine and Covenants. I just didn't think about it. Uh, so I included it this time, and it seems like the majority of people, well, not the majority, but 43%, uh, the highest percentage, wants to go over Doctrine and Covenants, which I, I you know, it's actually a really good idea because there's a lot that has to do with the second coming and Doctrine and Covenants. That, that scripture literally written in our own day, uh, in modern times. So, and there's a lot of stuff in there. So we'll do that. And then once we get to the to the close of that, uh, we'll do another poll. I'm assuming that things will remain the same. And Isaiah will probably take a uh, top spot after that. So uh, I, that's probably just how things are going to go. So gear up for Doctrine and Covenants. That's what we'll do next. And I'm going to try and do a video a day. Uh, because there's 138 sections, I may try and do like two sections or more. Uh, it, well, it's going to depend on the length of each section, obviously. Some of them I'll probably be able to do three sections in one video. But we're going to have to do probably like multiple videos to so it doesn't take forever to get through this. Otherwise, we're looking at 138 days uh, for us to get through Doctrine and Covenants. So we'll have to see if we can compress that a little bit. Okay, moving on to Daniel chapter 12. Okay. In the last days, Michael will deliver Israel from their troubles. Daniel tells of the two resurrections. The wise will know the times and meanings of his visions. And at the time, and at that time, sorry, and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth, standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. Okay. Again, let's let's read this again. In the last days, Israel will deliver Israel from their troubles. What I'm not sure at this point is if this is referring to the modern nation state of Israel. I think that's how some people read this. Um, but it could be talking about the church as a whole. We'll see what it says in the student manual and uh, go from there. Continuing, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Okay, so these are the, here's the two resurrections. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn away, or that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And uh, that's definitely taken place, especially since the rise of the internet. You know, that's what's making me be able to do this, deliver these videos to you, and uh, for us to be able to so easily access the scriptures now at the church website, and then also using very powerful tools like the Scripture Citation Index provided by BYU. Okay, next paragraph and verse. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood two other, the one on this side of the bank of the river, and the other on that side of the bank of the river. So if you'll recall, in case you last, you missed the last chapter, in chapter 11, he was standing on the bank of a river. He had a vision. It seemed to be visual in nature. There were other people with Daniel, but they didn't see it, but he did. And there was a figure, uh, it turned out to be Christ or Jehovah, standing above the river, uh, giving him a vision of the last days, like how things were 
going to play out from his time all the way to the last days. Okay, so now he's seeing two people. Um, there stood other two. So one on this side, one on that side. And one said to the man clothed in linen, that's the pre-mortal Christ, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, uh, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and in half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Again, we've gone over the meaning of time, times, and a half, or the symbol of three and a half, whether it's years or just a abstract uh, thing like this, because he doesn't say whether these are years or if it's in thousands of years or weeks or months or any other measurement of time. It just says time, times and a half. And what we've studied before, uh, I better pull it up uh, just so that you know where I'm getting this from. Okay, here it is. We're looking at the Institute Student Manual, uh, chapter 54 and then 55 for the New Testament. And it talks about this idea of three and a half, whether it's months or years or whatever. And I've read this before, but just for the people that are new. The angel told John that Jerusalem would be trodden underfoot 40 and two months in Revelation 11 2. 42 months is, a, is the equivalent of three and a half years. Likewise, the two witnesses mentioned in verse 3 would prophesy and testify of Jesus Christ for 1,260 days, or approximately three and a half years. They would be slain, and their bodies would lie in the street for three and a half days. In the scriptures, particularly in Revelation, the number three and a half often describes a limited period of tribulation during which evil forces are allowed to do their work. This is how I interpret any time three and a half comes up, okay, instead of trying to use it to calculate specific dates, because I know that the Jews use numbers in a very symbolic way, whether it's 7, 10, 70, you know, 42. Um, and we've talked about, well, let's continue. Since three and a half is half of seven, which symbolizes perfection and completion, it may represent imperfection and apostasy. It may also su suggest that God will not allow evil to go on unchecked. Evil's time is bounded and its limits are set. So instead of us, instead of giving us like an actual time, you know, because again, does it really make sense to you that you'd be able to, um, when, when Armageddon breaks out or when the final war uh, and the siege of Jerusalem breaks out? Does it really make sense to you that you'd be able to mark on a calendar, okay, it started three and a half years and then it's done? Does that sound right to you? Um, it doesn't to me. Uh, it makes more sense that what's being communicated is, look, there's going to be a bounded, limited period of time in which, for example, the great apostasy will take place. There's going to be a limited amount of time that Israel is under siege, or the Israel's attacked and Jerusalem under siege, and so on and so forth. Uh, when we skip forward to the next chapter, which covers chapters 12 through 16 of the book of Revelation, uh, it says this. The woman fleeing into the wilderness is symbolic of Satan, driving the ancient church into the period of the great apostasy, when the authority of the priesthood was taken from the earth following the deaths of Jesus Christ and his apostles. The Joseph Smith translation, and this is really big, this Joseph Smith translation, because this is a verse out of uh, the book of Revelation that is used to support the seven-year tribulation idea. The Joseph Smith translation of Revelation 12, 6 changes the term days to years. For insight on three and a half, sorry, for the insight on the three and a half times the church remains in the wilderness, see the commentary for da 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 da. Um, in fact, let's pull that up. Is that, no, I think that's what we're currently reading right now, what we just read. So, in other words, like I've said many times before, 
the period of the apostasy wouldn't be in terms of days so much as it would years. The apostasy went on for almost 2,000 years. So even though it doesn't give you, it's not, I don't think it's meant to give you a specific calculation uh, or a certain amount of time with which you could calculate how long the great apostasy would last. It gives you the idea that for a very long time, <clears throat> Satan would have his time to do his work. Okay. And do what God allows him to do, to test and to try and to persecute um, those that are good and uh, just have his time. So going back to Daniel, let's read that again. Okay. So one said to the man clothed in linen, oh my gosh. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? Right. So, again, what is he talking about? Um, he had mentioned the resurrection, right? Um, the time of the end right here. So the last days, the second coming. OK, so he's asking how long, how long until this happens? And Daniel says, and I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he had held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times and a half. So in other words, there's going to be a limited time. There's going to be a, a time when the enemy has power, when they're able to do their work, make their moves, but it's limited. And then it continues. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of thy holy people, all these things shall be finished. And uh, yeah, that's happened. Christ came. The ancient church uh, was essentially rebelled against, and um, key parts of it, specifically the priesthood keys, were preserved. But there was the great apostasy, right? And now there's a restoration, and there's persecution right now, and Satan's fighting against us, but there's a limit. Okay, it's not going to go on forever. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, Oh my Lord, that shall be the end of these things. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the, till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white. And I would think about like the temple uh, specifically with this verse, the way, just like the wording, but just generally joining the church and gaining exaltation. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand or sorry, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. So this is another again, just like one thousand two hundred and sixty days, this is essentially another three and a half year period. Okay, and we've already talked about the this abomination of desolation, the Romans uh, that destroy Jerusalem in the temple. Also, any other time that is destroyed, but I think more especially since we're talking about the last days, in that from the time that the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, roughly that time uh, began the great apostasy. I think that's what he's essentially talking about right here. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and thirty five days, or sorry, five and thirty days. But go thou. So, again, you might be, well, why is he giving these very specific numbers? And I can't say this uh, with authority, but at the same time, there's nobody with authority that has interpreted this. So it's like one of those things that you that you let be. But the fact that you have this great apostasy going for this amount of time and then is saying, well, those who uh, wait until beyond that time, you know, just a little bit after that, um, blessed is he. Right. So if you think about it, those who are essentially that make it to the second coming and then go into the millennium, de they're definitely blessed. Blessed are they that don't give in. Uh, to Satan during his time when he's allowed to do his work and um, have his way with the world. Blessed is he that gets through that and then passes on to the next stage. All right, and then verse 13, the last verse of the book, 
But go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy holy lot at the end of the days. Yeah, because at the end of the days, that's when the resurrection is going to happen. And if Daniel hasn't been resurrected yet, or even if he has, uh, that's that's a time of, of uh, essentially inheritance, you know. Okay, let's see what it says in the student manual. So Daniel 12, verse 4, increase of knowledge in the last days. Concerning the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy about an increase of knowledge, President Spencer W. Kimball observed, quote, 19th century theologians thought they saw the fulfillment of these predictions in the coming of the steam engine, the sewing machine, the motor car. What they saw was but the dim beginnings of the most spectacular increase of knowledge since men first dwelt upon the earth. Could they emerge from their graves today and behold the giant rocket in flight, a man-made satellite in orbit, and, move, and moving pictures of the moon or Mars appearing on a TV set, uh, a famous choir in South Dakota singing to much of the earth through the satellite off in space. They would recognize in all these and numerous other space age marvels the fulfillment far beyond their expectations, but nonetheless valid for all of that. Now, if you'll remember, I have this um, spreadsheet. Let me pull it up. It's my second coming timeline spreadsheet. Let's see, where is it? Second coming. And off to the side here. So columns uh, D through M are for events. Okay, for events that have taken place through this timeline. But columns... N through P are for periods of time. So, for example, what I mean by that, uh, you could, maybe I should rename it ages. I'm not sure. I'm just going to leave it as periods. I think there's a reason why I did that. So you can see here. I'm going to zoom in. Right now, we're uh, what they refer. We're in what's referred to as the information age. And uh, let me go back to the beginning of the information age. I might have to zoom out. Maybe click a few times over here. Okay, right here. Um, it's considered as having started uh, in the 1970s. All right. I should find a source for that. I can't remember what I used to determine that, but it seemed like everyone agreed that basically the 1970s uh, began the information age. Uh, before that, the industrial age. Which uh, and it's interesting because when okay when was it that he that Spencer W. Kimball said that Let me look at that again. Uh, Nineteen seventy six. So even he was just at the beginning of the information age as he was saying that. And I don't need to tell you how information has increased since that time, since the seventies, and and <laughs> uh, how astonished Spencer W. Kimball might be uh, with the internet, you know. Remember, we're, we're doing this, um, let me go to this. We're doing this flood the earth challenge where the reason, the main reason why we're really doing this is because um, Elder Rasband, he gave a talk. Let, let me pull a couple things up. Hold on. Okay, here we go. So <clears throat> in Elder Rasband's talk called This Day in October 2022 General Conference, he said this. He says, when you hand them a Book of Mormon, you're opening their minds and hearts to the Word of God. You do not need to carry printed copies of the Book, Book of Mormon with you. Now, this has kind of been the case up until now. Like, yes, you could send them a link to the church website to the, the Book of Mormon. Um, but I'm not aware of how long the Book of Mormon app has been around. He says, you can easily share it from your mobile phone from the scriptures section of the Gospel Library app. So what he's talking about here, and I've shown this before on the channel, if you go to your the Gospel Library app, and and hopefully all of you have this, have this you really should, because uh, for one, it's very useful and it's it's an easy way to ac access the scriptures as well as many other church uh, materials. But when you go to the scriptures section, okay, so you're like wanting to read the scriptures at the top. It has mobile app, the Book of Mormon, share now. And this is an app uh, that is specifically the Book of Mormon, and it's geared toward people that aren't members of the church. So it's not the Gospel Library app with all the rest of this. 
it's uh, focused on the Book of Mormon, and it has a copy of the Book of Mormon in it. Okay, and so um, when we go over here to the Book of Mormon Sharing Challenge, and I haven't updated this uh, for like a video or two, but we're at 6,016 copies of the Book of Mormon that have been shared. I mean, this is direct evidence right here of how knowledge has been increased. I've been trying um, my best to keep track of what method people are using to share the Book of Mormon. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't specify. I, what, what I want to know is if you've sent it by text, email, social media, direct message, which means, you know, like when you message some, somebody in Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatever app you use, Snapchat. Um, so I have a bunch that are unspecified, 3,177. But you can see that a lot of a lot of these have been shared through electronic means. And then in person and in mail uh, accounts for less than that. So if we're just comparing this to this. So truly, we're living in an era where uh, <laughs> there are things possible now that weren't possible before. And we should all take advantage of this. This is one of the reasons why I'm doing this uh, challenge, you know, uh, to bring awareness to the fact that you can easily share the Book of Mormon just like this. You click on this and then your phone will pull up, uh, you know, how do you want to share it? Do you want to text it? Do you want to email it? Do you want to post it on Facebook? Do you want to send a direct message to one of your friends? There's multiple ways. And at this point, there really shouldn't be any excuse why you haven't hit up everybody that you have their information for, you know, just give them the chance. You don't have to sell it. You don't have to be a salesperson, uh, just share it. And then for all, you know, the Lord has prepared them for that very moment when you've shared it. So just do it, be prayerful, you know, make it as personal as possible. But even if you can't really, it's just someone that you just kind of know, just do it anyway, because something is better than nothing. So going back to this, uh, yeah, since 1976, things have only accelerated as far as the increase of knowledge. Okay, Daniel 12, verses 7 through 13. How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? The interpretation of the time periods mentioned in these verses has not been revealed by the Lord as yet. And that's really all you need to know. Joseph Smith said, that if the Lord doesn't provide an interpretation of things, then you just leave it be, and it'll be revealed in the future. Anyway, numerous calculations and formulas have been put forward, uh, each in turn, to be proven wrong. <laughs> and we've talked about that a number of times, uh, the most famous of which was the the Millerite prediction. I... Um, Oh yeah, look, it's, it's, he's talking about right here. William Miller, a founder of the Adventist movement, predicted Christ coming in 1844, which prediction Joseph Smith declared to be false. We've gone over this before, and we've read from uh, teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. Miller's calculation came from an interpretation of this passage in Daniel. Time and, t time and again, people have thought they had the key and enticed others to believe, only to reap disappointment. Even today, there are those who predict earthquakes and great calamities occurring on specific dates based on this passage in Daniel, and sadly, they still entice others to believe and follow. The Prophet Joseph Smith said that if the Lord did not get... Here it is, look! The Prophet Joseph Smith said that if the Lord did not give the key for interpreting a symbol or image he employed, he would not hold his children responsible for it. For reasons not at present known, the Lord has not revealed the key for interpreting this passage, and until he does so, speculation and calculation are pointless. All right, points to ponder. So this is because we're wrapping up the entire book, and uh, I kind of skimmed through this, and it seems like there's a couple good things here. Okay, what does the life of Daniel suggest about the ability of a saint to serve in public office and still not compromise gospel standards? Yeah, we've talked about that. The book of Daniel, I really think it's a book really needed in our time, in addition to all other books of scripture. But this one really stands out because we know that the powers of the world are becoming more and more focused in on a particular agenda. Everyone's in lockstep. Okay, but Daniel lived in the original Babylon, 
and he served in Babylon. He served the king. Uh, he wasn't a zealot. A zealot meaning somebody that, you know what, we should look that up. Let's look it up. Let's go to pull up my, the dictionaries. Now, the zealots were a, a sect of Judaism at the time of Christ, but let's see what it says in the dictionaries here. Zealot for Miriam, zealot for Oxford, zealot, Webster's Dictionary, um, 1828. So Miriam Webster says a fanatical partisan. Uh, a member of a fanatical sect ar arising in Judea during the first century AD and militantly opposed to Roman domination of Palestine. You know, when you look into the different sects at the time of the Jews, I think that that really corresponds to now and how, how we respond to uh, the powers that be, right? Um, and sadly, I think too many people fall under this category of zealots you know at the time uh, at the time of christ this group of jews uh they were violent uh not just against the the romans but against fellow jews they were violent they killed they killed people um they were just basically uh all against like there was no finding common ground there were it was just full-on fighting kicking and screaming the entire time that the Romans were there. And what did Christ teach? He taught, give to Caesar that which belongs to Caesar, and give to God that which belongs to God. Did Christ fight the Romans? No, he didn't. But the Zealots did. Let's see what it says in Oxford. A person who is extremely enthusiastic about something, especially religion or politics. All right, and then Webster's. Uh, zealot, one who engages warmly in any cause and pursues his object with earnestness and ardor. It is generally used in dispraise or applied to one whose ardor is intemperate and censurable. The fury of zealots was one cause of the destruction of Jerusalem. Oh, yeah, look at that. It actually helped bring about the fall of Jerusalem. If I'm not mistaken, I think that Masada, I th let's see, fall of Masada zealots. What was it? The zealots that were, that were there at Masada. Um, according to modern interpretations of Josephus and Sicari, the, okay. According to modern interpretations of Josephus, the Sicari were an extremist splinter group of the zealots and were equally ant antagonistic to both Romans and other Jewish groups. It was the zealots, in contrast to the Sicarii, who carried the main burden of the rebellion uh, which opposed Roman rule of Judea. So don't be a Latter-day zealot. Follow the example of Daniel Follow the example of Christ. Follow the example of our current prophet. All of them work with the powers that be without compromising their values. And I know that that's really hard. You know, the natural man inside of us just wants to fight and fight. And we need to bring them down and we need to rebel and we need to da 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 da. That's, that's wrong. That's wrong. We recognize that there's evil. We recognize that there. That it's not, they're not all bad. The Roman Empire was not all bad. You know, there's this black and white thinking where it's like, no, they're e they're either all evil or they're all good, but there's no middle ground. That That's the zealot uh, mind frame, right? There was good in the Roman Empire. We've benefited from a lot uh, that the Romans did. Um, and the same today, there's, there's both good and bad in all the different power centers in the world. There is good and bad. And what we should attempt to do is work with the good side, find common ground, and uh, the way that Christ said it is, agree with thine enemy while thou art in the way. Otherwise, they're going to trample you and they're going to throw you into prison. And that's exactly what, essentially what happened with the zealots. 
they fought, they fought, they fought, and they brought about their own destruction because they were fighting somebody that was much more powerful than they were. All right, so that's what we learned. What does the life of Daniel suggest about the ability of a saint to serve in public office and still not compromise gospel standards? Well, that. Okay, could he have survived without divine intervention? Uh, I don't think so. When does God intervene? What are the conditions of intervention? Uh, so we know the story of... Um, <laughs> honey, help me. M Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Uh, he intervened after they had done all that they could do. They weren't actively fighting against the Babylonians. They were actually going along with them, serving them. But when it came to uh, times where they wanted them to go against go against the commandments and covenants, so so not not their political beliefs, not the way that they felt as about certain things, but they they held true to God's commandments, the things that God had commanded, right? And they they didn't break the commandments, and that's when God intervened. Okay. Can he intervene without the unusual circumstances such as were associated with his intervention for Daniel? Oh yeah, remember they, they also didn't eat uh, the meat that wasn't kosher. Okay, what lessons about adhering to one's standards can be learned from the experience of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, according to Daniel 3? Note especially verses 28 to 29, how might adhering to your standards affect those persons who do not feel as you do? Read verses 25 through 28. Okay. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the, the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire, and the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors, being gathered together, saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was an hair of their head singed, neither were their coats, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed up, passed on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be, look at this, this is the thing. Imagine situations where you uh, keep the commandments and you have to separate that from doing political things or things for political reasons. You keep the commandments that are actually given by God, right? You don't compromise those commandments or your covenants for the world. So imagine times when you have done that and people see it and maybe see some kind of blessing come upon you or see how you're living your life and you're happy or whatever the case may be. Maybe sometimes it's more miraculous. Maybe sometimes it's more mundane, but they see that you're living a better life and that things are uh, working for you in certain ways. So then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his saints that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. So when you set that example, again, not fighting, not being a zealot, just simply being a humble servant of God, humbly uh, keeping the commandments, not compromising your values, you know, the Lord will sustain you, bless you, and there will be times when other people will see it. And it may even... Uh, give them the beginning of a testimony or may make them interested in the church when they see how you react to things compared to how the world reacts to things. Okay, a great blessing from the Lord came to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because of their loyalty to God. They had supported the Lord, and he then supported them <clears throat> in their time of need. Elder Spencer W. Kimball spoke of their integrity. Quote, bound securely in, the, in their inflammable clothes, uh, they were consigned to the fiery death, which no mere man could survive. But on the morning, the king Nebuchadnezzar himself, sorry, but on the morning, the king Nebuchadnezzar himself, in astonishment, in awe, found four personages in the furnace. And he said, and we read that, at the command of the king, they came forth unburned, unhurt, not even a hair of their heads, heads singed, and no smell of fire on their clothes. Integrity. 
The promises of eternal life from God supersede all promises of men to greatness, comfort, immunities. These men of courage and integrity were saying, we do not have to live, but we must be true to ourselves and God. And it reminds us of the more modern man of integrity, Abraham Lincoln, who said, I am not bound to win, but I am bound to be true. I am bound to succeed. I'm not bound to succeed, but I am bound to live by the light that I have. As these, as these brave men were threatened, they did not know that Shakespeare, long centuries later, uh, was to say, There is no terror in, in your threats, for I am an arm so strong in honesty that they pass by me as the idle wind, which I respect not. Integrity in man should bring inner peace, sureness of purpose, and security in action. Lack of integrity brings disunity, fear, sorrow, unsureness. What is the message of Belshazzar's experience in Daniel 5? Uh, compare with chapter... Okay, I'm not going to... Could you could you ever be in a position similar to that of Belshazzar was in? Uh, no, I don't want to read that. We've already gone over that. So... I mean, so there you have it. Daniel is an incredible book. It should help us navigate these last days in what our attitude should be toward worldly powers. Not to, like, you know, embrace their ideologies, not to help those ideologies, but where possible, serving and sticking to our values and being examples. And that's exactly what the church is doing. Don't be a zealot. Okay. That's going to be it for this one. Next time we'll be in uh, Doctrine and Covenants. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video if you liked it, leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also make sure to share it and I'll talk to you guys later.